What do you get when you mix one part philosophy, one part politics, and cut it with a healthy shot of history? You get the perfect podcast cocktail. Thank you for listening. Now sit back, open your drinks, and open your minds. This is Six Pack Philosophy. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy with Mike and John. I'm Anastasia, and this week we are discussing the practice and ethics of city and urban planning. But before we get started, guys, what are we drinking? We are drinking Pecan Ale with Honey from the BS Brewing Company in Seguin, Texas. Seguin, Texas. And I don't know what What the ABV is. What is Seguin known for? Nothing. Being between (laughs) Gonzalez and San Antonio. (laughs) They are known for the infamous BS Brewing Company. Is that what it says? I don't know. So this is Pecan Ale. Yes. Guys, we're going to have to stop this for a second. I'm sorry, or just whatever. I'm not getting anything through this now, all of a sudden. Okay. Um, So I know we've already popped. There we go. All right. Just keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Cool. That works. Audio issues. Got a little podcast. Always something. Always something. And we tested this beforehand. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, uh, Madam Mistress, you, you want to talk to us a little bit about what's going on? I thought you were going to do that. Well, I was waiting on the introduction that you wrote. Oh, I already did it. Oh, uh, that, that was it? That was it. That was it? Yeah. Lord. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're talking a little bit about... We, we have a low budget. We couldn't afford a better intro. I'm telling you. It's, 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 it's <laughs> hey. kind, of, kind of bizarre. I was so distracted by the fact that my, my headphones weren't hear. working. Oh, that's I, what it was. You didn't hear it. I couldn't hear I it. I see. Uh, are we sure we should? Well, we're all right. So we're yeah, talking we're about um, we're talking a little bit about urban planning, urban sprawl, and uh, you know when I first got into this, the plan was that we would uh, I'd look at zoning and, and, and zoning laws, but you know as, as often happens on the show, I think we've all experienced it where where you say I'll, I'll take the lead on this and you start researching, and the next thing you know you're uh, you know you're doing something totally you're different. down some fucking rabbit hole somewhere yeah. doing something else right yeah. yeah well that's kind of what happened with me and I I ended up doing this this really deep dive into urban planning. And I, I found myself, I watched college uh, college lectures on this. I watched TED Talks on this. I watched uh, all, all kinds of stuff. I uh, started reading about this stuff. I'm probably, I've discovered that I'm probably going to be fascinated by this for a while. Mm-hmm. And, you know, six months from now, I'm still going to be talking to you about urban planning <laughs> because it's it's something it's a lot more interesting than I thought it would have been. I'm telling you, we got to get you into city council meetings. I don't live in the city. It I doesn't matter. in the city. So <laughs> they you don't know that. Hell, though. Yeah. All right, so let, let's talk a little bit about, about about how cities have developed. Okay, Just because you know I, I teach this in my, my classes how that you know you get your rings of of, of the city, mm-hmm. and you know traditionally most of your cities have have been where uh, for most of history your wealthy people have lived in the city downtown, and then you've had your zone of emergence right around there, which was your you know your your middle class, mm-hmm. and then way out in the outskirts you had your your squatter settlements, your people that were too poor to live in the city. That has been most of history, okay? But we've kind of we kind of turned that on its head uh, with the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. With the Industrial Revolution, we brought all these factories into cities. All of a sudden, we had serious health problems. We had we had air pollution. We had water pollution. We had noise pollution. All this was happening, and people wanted to get away from that. Mm-hmm. So our cities reversed themselves. Your wealthy people ended up moving out and, and, and establishing these manors out. You know, they kicked the squatters out. They built these large manors out there. Uh, your zone of emergence ends up being the area that's today we'd call the suburbs. It's mm-hmm. the area between the, the wealthy area and the city. And the abandoned old city became uh, this dilapidated area of, of uh, uh, you know, the poorest, poorest parts and oftentimes minority neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that became the way things were from about – you know, late 1870 all the way. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I'm, I'm going to say you lost me, and I'm, I'm thinking if you lost me, you probably lost someone at home, but yeah. it may just be me. I, I got that, <clears throat> excuse me, dur- during the switch, the very wealthy went to the outside ring. Yeah. What were the two, uh, like, were you saying the poorest were on the very inner circle or the, or the middle? No, the poorest ended up moving into those areas that were abandoned by the wealthy. They, the, these areas that, because by this point they were older, they were, they, they were the older buildings, they weren't what they used to be. So, so uh, like, yeah, kind of yeah. in the, the center. Inner yeah, city. yeah, the inner okay. city. They became okay. the inner city. Uh, and, and, and the middle class just kind of hung out where they well, were. The, the middle class moved out a little further, but they, they kind of stayed there. And that's kind of okay. what always happened. Okay. If you look at the way the, the, these works, uh, this works, wherever the upper class goes, the middle 
middle class then uh, tries to as follow. close to them as they can get. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's something that in the uh, in the 1980s and 90s we referred to as uh, drive till you qualify. I don't know if y'all know what that means or not, not but in, in, in the housing boom. People found that uh, they oh. lived in the cities, but they couldn't afford to live. You know, they, they drove until they could uh, uh, qualify to live somewhere. Yeah, and you ended up with these these suburbs <laughs> that were very gentrified, where mm. where you had all these people that that, that that are in this upper middle class lived in this gated neighborhood, and all these people in the lower middle class lived in the, the this suburb, and then the the extreme low low class live in you know these older neighborhoods, these more ghettoized areas. Mm-hmm. But something weird happened uh, about the turn of the last century, but about about the year 2000, in the 90s, 2000s, mm-hmm. we start seeing that reverse again. Yeah. We started seeing the wealthy moving back into the cities. Uh, and and they, what drove that? Well, what ended up doing is 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 they ended up coming in and cities were, were giving tax breaks in order to, to get people to come in. And they were condemning these, these neighborhoods mm. and largely forcing the, uh, the, the, the minorities out of these neighborhoods flattening them and, uh, and and coming back in with condos and, and high rise uh, high rise luxury apartments well what's that going to do it's going to mean that the the middle class are going to move back back towards that again and now what have we done we've, we've created another system of of, of uh, pushing pushing the poor out of their homes and we've done this over and over again okay mm-hmm. so I see that as, as, as the historical model that, that we've been following. I just kind of wanted to throw that out there, at, at, you know, in, in the background of it, because everything changed uh, with this industrial revolution and and, and, right. and the movement of this. Think about your cities before the industrial revolution. They were they were mixed use cities. You had situations where in a neighborhood, and a neighborhood, you know, say, say sixteen blocks. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's kind of what we generally consider a neighborhood in. in, in I say we like I'm an urban planner. Yeah, right. But urban <laughs> planners generally consider neighborhoods about 16 blocks. You, you got the YouTube certification. I, I do. I, yeah. I watched all the YouTube videos. I'm now qualified to teach this. Yes. Uh, but on that area, they would have situations where you'd have a neighborhood bakery, a neighborhood bar, mm-hmm. a neighborhood restaurant, uh, a small uh, grocery store. It would all be right there, and you could walk to everything. Yeah. That is gone now. Oh, yeah. And that's been gone since, well, since the 1950s. Uh, our image of the suburbs, uh, it, it's just its just not there anymore. It's, it's not what we see in the movies. We're not talking about Ward and June Cleaver and Leave it to Beaver here anymore. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a situation where where people are, are today, <coughs> they're living in a suburbs that is so separate from their everyday life that you can't you can't walk to the store. You can't walk to uh, to, to your uh, uh, you know your little cafe down the, down the street. Yeah, you, you expect living in the suburbs that you will commute no less than half an hour to get yeah. to work every and, day. And it's because we're in a car culture. Oh yeah, we have a we have a, a an, an urban system that was built to make the cars happy, not to be not built to make people happy. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned that. I uh, for for a, a good stint, a couple months, was uh, riding my bicycle to work every day, and and you know th- there were a couple driving factors in that I didn't want to have to buy another car just from financial standpoints it was a, a physical health thing and a couple different things you know it was it was also nice to get out on the bike and, and pedal around um so i was doing that and time wasn't one that bad it was it was like an extra five minutes to work for me just because of all the stoplights and i could <laughs> i could get on my bike and you know and and just boogie the reason i stopped doing it was because the way the highways and everything are built there is no respect for for cyclists or pedestrians mm-hmm. out there, and this and is a it's small town. Dangerous. Yeah, and and I had a few uh, uh, close calls, and I said, you know what, this isn't worth dying over. Yeah, you know, uh, I had one where I was, so you know, you, you're the problem. You're the problem because oh, you yeah. weren't willing to give your life up yeah, for the right? cause of bicycling, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times that I I was riding to work and I thought I was about to get like clipped in the back of the head by an eighteen wheeler. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's funny. I'm I'm gonna go off on a on a little rabbit chase here. Um, there is really this underlying kind of um, culture clash between uh, cyclist, uh, motorcyclist, and um, uh, uh, car people and pedestrians as, as another kind of group and it was so funny recently we kind of we, we kind of got to see that that undertone bubble up to the surface uh maybe we'll put a link in i, I don't remember all the details off the top of my head but but there was a city that was putting in bike lanes and this guy who is a well-known internet troll he is famous for 
making these these joke movements and getting people to buy into them. <coughs> mm-hmm. He made this day of protest where people were going to picket and walk down the bike lane and like make a big bike lane protest against having bike lanes installed. And he made this joke expecting it to go nowhere. He didn't even show up to the thing. A group formed and came in brandishing signs and walking down that bike lane seriously, including one that compared bikers to Nazis. (laughs) <laughs> cyclists to Nazis like what yes no it was it was hilarious the news showed up and interviewed them like this turned into a thing and and I think that really speaks to kind of this the, the, this fight that's going on over the ability to travel travel mm-hmm. space and travel amenities yeah, yeah. among the groups yeah well and just just the problem that we have with our cities if you look at uh, at, at numbers okay we can go back to 1950, and in 1950, somewhere around 35% of the world population lived in urban areas, okay? Mm-hmm. Today, that number is it, it, it's approaching 60% of the world population lives in cities. That, that tells you something's going on. Yeah. New York City is, is projected to add a million people to it in the next decade. Holy New York, and, and, and they've got no place to build. They're, yeah. on, they're an island. Uh, so you've got problems with that. Yeah. Uh, the problems that come with this that people don't think about, if, particularly if you're in a car culture, uh, Dallas, right here near us. Mm-hmm. Dallas is a car city, without a doubt. It's very yeah. much a car culture. It, it, it's urban sprawl everywhere. At the rate Dallas is growing, its uh, its air pollution is out of control. Mm-hmm. Houston, uh, the largest unzoned city in the world, the uh, the air pollution there is ridiculous. I can remember about... 10 years ago watching C-SPAN and and Houston bypassed Los Angeles as having the worst air uh, uh, air pollution problem in the country, Mm -hmm. a smog problem. Uh, The only reason I can remember this is because at the video there was a guy back there in the back with a great big foam finger that said we're number one. I thought that was kind of funny. (laughs) But, uh, uh, you know, so so you Take what you can get, right? Take what you can get, right? (laughs) So you look at this and you realize there's a problem. Mm -hmm. There's a problem that, that, that we have to solve. So how do you go about solving that? And, and, and what caused that problem to begin with? I want to talk a little, little bit about interstates. Um, uh, real yeah, quick. So I, I just uh, quickly uh, grabbed the mistress phone because we're recording on, our, on, on my phone. Because, hey, guys, by the way, we are starting to put video of these podcasts right. on That's YouTube right. if you want to go check so out you our You can YouTube look up channel. there and see my bald spot. You can Abs- watch how it's like. not really a bald spot so much as a bald head. Yeah. Yeah. How I like the very first sip of the first show that we're recording to put on YouTube. I spilled down my shirt. So finish your beers. Finish your yeah. beers. He, he, here, here's, the, here's the problem with this is you get to see the looks on our face when we take that first sip. It <laughs> might give away the, the ratings a little bit. Yeah. But so so I did a little quick math. <laughs> quick math. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a little quick can... math. John, John did some quick math. So, well, you know. <laughs> uh, so I said... How much is a million people? Like, because a human mind can't visualize yeah. that. So, so there are four people in the room. How many times would we have to double this podcast? So, so if you double it once, you get eight people. If you double it twice, you get sixteen, then thirty-two, and you start growing really fast. How many times do you think you have to double this podcast to get a million people? Twelve. No idea. Sixteen. Ah, Sixteen. So close. That was not close at all. <laughs> it was very close. Okay. Sixteen. T- that's In the grand a lot. scope of all the numbers, sixteen is very close to twelve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Not on logarithmic scale. Uh, okay. Not the point. Uh, but it, it, it's amazing to me the problems that we have here. Yeah. So. Let's talk about the interstates a little bit. Uh, something that, that everybody in this room, interstates has been part of our life, mm-hmm. our, our, our whole life. And we forget how new they are. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, by the way, so a, a little fact that I picked up. Do you realize that the interstate highway system that was, that was planned by President Eisenhower in the 1950s was declared? What year do you think it was de- declared to be complete? <coughs> it it has been declared to be complete. 2004. Nin- 1995. 2001. I was close. In 2001, they declared that the interstate highway system was complete. And here yeah. I am thinking to myself, I thought it would have been completed well before that. Now, that doesn't, uh, mean, that, that, that doesn't mean that it's not widening at all. That means that the, the original plan of connecting, everything was connected the way, the way it was originally planned to be. That took a while. In 2001, yeah, uh, pretty amazing. I was close. That was my dating victory cry for years. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm close. sure it was. Close. I'm I was sure. almost in there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eisenhower. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this guy. President Eisenhower, uh, if, if you know your history, was you know, this, this great general, uh, commanded the D-Day uh, uh, operation. This guy uh, 
was 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 the person most responsible for on the American side, at least, of winning World War II. Mm -hmm. Well, when he was a young lieutenant, you know, 22, 23 years old in the Army, he was was sent from one coast to the other, and I've forgotten which direction he went, Pacific to Atlantic or Atlantic to Pacific, but from one coast to the other with a, a convoy. Mm -hmm. And it took him 62 days to make it from one coast to the other driving across the country. Oh, wow. And he wrote a, a, a memo at this point as a young lieutenant to the Army saying that, that, that he thinks the Army should go to the, go to the uh, federal government and um, see about establishing a paved two-lane highway system connecting all the military bases in the country because in the event of war, we wouldn't be able to move move goods fast enough. Yeah, strategically, this that is a, is a this really is a young idea. lieutenant that says this. Well, he goes off uh, World War II. Uh, you know, he's a general by this point. And at World War II, he discovered you know, the Autobahn was in place mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Germany and, and France had connected to it. And he discovered how quickly he could move troops through this. And he came back convinced that the United States needed an equivalent of that. And he put it upon him as his own responsibility to um, to build this this system. Now that system was originally seen as connecting our military bases, mm -hmm. and then it was spread out to connect our major cities. But Eisenhower's view of this was to connect. Uh, you know, these, these interstates would would skirt the cities. They would come along, they would connect, and then your highways would go out into the cities. Um, that idea was then taken over by this lobby organization led by General Motors mostly, but, uh, but, but sure. Ford was involved in all this. The, the chairman of it was the CEO of General Motors, who had started back in 1939 talking about this idea of, of connecting everybody with superhighways. Mm -hmm. And he ends up going to Congress and uh, convinces them or lobbies them to appropriate funds to, to, to build these, these interstates to all these cities. And while some cities were against it, what ultimately came out was this fund where the federal government would pay 90% of the cost mm -hmm. to build this, and the states would then be responsible for 10%. And it, it, was, it was a mandate. If you, want, if you want the 90%, the state has to pick up the other 10%. Mm -hmm. It can't be left to the, to the lo localities. So every state accepted this, and we ended up with this interstate system. And that's why the interstates ended up going through the cities, mm -hmm. is because – of a funding scheme that was done. Well, and this all makes sense to me, and it makes sense why the federal government got involved from a strategic military perspective. My only question is, why were they building these 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 flat concrete things and not magical vacuum tube trains that can go at 99% efficiency? Yeah, Elon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on now. It's the future. Yeah, yeah, well... The, yes. the 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 idea was amazing to me, and I think I, I, I think we all support the idea of. A, a, I, I hope we all support the idea of a uh, of an interstate system. Whether yeah. we support well, let's the talk way about the it was done. Constitutionality of it, though. Well, because uh, I think they should have been connecting all the post offices. Well, are there post offices at the uh, on the bases? Sure, there are. Mm. But there are also a lot of other post yeah. offices. But there, but there's also a constitutional yeah. uh, principle be behind behind uh, having a military. Yeah, so you, no, you know, I'm joking. I think there, I think there, there is a a purpose to that. Mm -hmm. now, I question as to whether there's a purpose for that going into the cities. So the cities then then look at this and they saw it as a as another tool. While at first they're very much against the idea of the interstates going through the cities because businesses were, were worried about um, – Bypass. Bypass, yeah. yeah. Um, they very quickly discovered that there was something they could use this for, and that was the urban blight I talked to you about a little while ago mm -hmm. where the, the people had left and the, the, uh, the, the wealthy had left and had left – a ghettoized community here in the mm -hmm. inner cities. They saw this as a chance to, uh, to to get rid of this urban blight. And in almost every case, the interstates were sent through your, your ethnic communities, your ethnic ghettos right. that were seen as blight, and they went through and flattened them. Uh, I think about a, uh, a a great example in Detroit. Uh, I, I was watching, the, reading about this and watching some videos. There was a place called Black Bottom in Detroit, which was a thriving African American community. Uh, I mean, it, a, a very, very uh, successful African American community. Mm -hmm. uh, but they went through it, and the reason they went through it was because the original plan called for going through a, a gentrified white community, and they protested. So they moved the interstate. They went through this, uh, and 
they didn't put any off ramps. They just went straight through it. Through it. So this allowed the the uh, the wealthy whites in the suburbs to get on the interstate, travel in to to their job in the inner city, and never get off and never even notice this this other community. Yeah. Today, if you go on Google Earth and you look at Black Bottom, you see green spots. And the reason why is because the houses are all gone. There's mm-hmm. nothing there. All there is is, is is empty grass lots. That's all there is of an area that before 1950 was one of the most successful communities in the, in the Detroit area. Mm-hmm. In this case, the interstate actually killed a thriving community. Right. Uh, the other thing that, 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 I, I just, that I learned about this is that in 1950, the average American spent 20% of their income on transportation. Sounds about right. Today, it's 40%. 40% of our income. Transportation on, tra- on your on, on your car, car, buying a car, having gas, uh, all this stuff. So you start seeing that. Here's the other thing: ninety percent of that money does not stay in your community. Ninety percent of yeah. money spent on transportation goes to another community. Mm-hmm. So we've created a system with the interstates where we've made it easy to get into and out of, but we've also made it easy for the money to leave. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to go back and address a point you made about how. They use the interstate system as a mechanism for uh, uh, leveling uh, uh, blights, and and a lot of these end up being black communities. Um, we we've talked before, and I I think Mike, you you've made the statement that like uh, race relations in this country are the worst you've seen them since uh, in, in my life. Yeah, yeah, or at and, least since I was a very young man. Yeah, yeah, and so you know I, I I think about it now and. I, I kind of start to question that because, yeah, there, there is a much more vocal fight going on. And, and I think that, that that's something we need to address and we, we need to kind of uh, coalesce and, 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 and be, be more cooperative in that in that effort from both sides, uh, both sides, all sides. I mean, I mean there, there's not two sides to, to, to the race yeah. issue. Um, but I do also look at and I say... But when was the last time we went through and bombed or flattened or, or you know, I'm We're not still gonna, doing it. Well, OK, we are still doing it um, to an extent. We're also still doing it to white communities. It is it is not a as prevalent thing for us to go through and level a community for it being black. Well, now, now it's actually more the other way around. Most of our new roads and stuff that we're doing this through, they're going through and they're, they're taking gentrified rural areas. And, you know, the, the arguments now it are you're going, you know, you're putting a pipeline through my, my pasture. You're mm-hmm. putting a road through my pasture. And that's, that's, not, a, that, that, that's not a racial thing. Yeah, and, and so I'm not going to say it never happens. I'm not going to say we have, we have completely cured uh, uh, using either, either um, condemning or whatever against black communities. I'm not trying to make that statement at all. But I, I think there is a clear difference in the, the degree and and frequency. We're uh, not redlining frequency. anymore. Exactly. And, and so from that perspective, yeah, there may be a much more vocal argument. But do we have better race, race relations from the perspective of actually, you know, not, not bombing communities and stuff, you know? I well, think I think maybe we have, I think maybe our government is better at race relations, but I don't think our people are perceiving it as, a better, as better. I think right now we are more divided as a people. Well, and I think. Than in my life. I think back then it was just more accustomed that you just had to take it. Um, and I think now there's more tension for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, people are saying this isn't right and it's, it's making other people uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, but, but, but that, that leg to stand on that, that, that fight back. I mean, I think that that's a a sign of progress, not, I'm not not saying it's not, I think you're right. Uh, but, but uh, again, as I look at it, I, I don't see that we are improving over the last 30 years. I say we're improving. We've improved over the last 50 years. In the last 30 years, I, I, I feel like I feel like we've been going backwards in, in, in race relations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, I, and it, it it may be my perception as a white man. You know, I've, I've yeah. got, we got to take that into consideration too. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we all uh, have our biases. Know, we all have our, our biases, yeah. and and maybe it's the fact that that you know, for the first time in history, uh, you know. My group is being held accountable for something, and right. uh, and I'm noticing something that I, I wouldn't notice before. It's, on, it's in your backyard instead yeah. of you yeah. know. Yeah. So no. so I, you know trying to be fair there. 
Let's talk about what else the interstate does. You know, we've we've shown how it it can be used to to, to flatten blighted areas. Mm-hmm. We've shown how it can be used to pull money out of a community. Now it brings money in too because mm-hmm. it brings supplies in and stuff, but it also pr- creates a a physical barrier that that breaks up neighborhoods and and st- stops you from. Uh, uh, you know, from being able to share with your neighbor, mm-hmm. it becomes dangerous to to try and walk or ride your bike across the street with interstate systems. Yeah. Oh yeah, we and had a uh, we had an event where the the event was happening in one place, and we had a deal with a hotel that was just across the street. Guys, yeah. it's fine. It was across a fucking interstate. Like that is not. Yeah. Yeah, it's walking distance. It's not walking safe, though. It might yeah. as well have been the Berlin Wall between yeah. us and us. I like the fact that you said that because I saw one uh, one urban planner who described, and, I, and, and it's a little bit of, of hyperbole, but I think it, you know it, it hit home with me that if you go in our major cities, you discovered that we've built Berlin walls all over the country. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. have built walls where on one side of the interstate you have wealthy uh, wealthy people, and on the other side you have the extreme poor ghettoized uh, neighborhood. We yeah, can see the this. same thing as being from the wrong side of the track. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I was actually it's about just to, with the interstate. I was yeah. actually about to say that. You know, I I grew up in Natchez. So I've I've been in Palestine for a while. I've been here, and in both those communities, and and I would imagine it's a reflection of of across the nation. Though you know, other people may tell me I'm wrong. There was literally a wrong side of the railroad tracks. You could literally cross yeah, the tracks yeah. and see. Holy fuck, what happened over here, you know? You know, I had a buddy of mine, uh, when I first got out of the Marine Corps, this would have been like 96, 97, he came down to visit me. And he, he's from Nebraska, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, not known for being a bastion of, of, of you know, of racial mixing, you, you know? But he got down here, and uh, I was just riding him around, showing him things. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, he said, Mike, you realize y'all are still segregated, right? Mm-hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? This is not segregated. He said, "He said I've been here 15 minutes. I know where the blacks live. I yep. know where the Mexicans live. And I know where the whites live. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was right. Yeah. He was right. Uh, uh, and, and if you look at it right here, it's our highways that do it for the most part. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Can go, we, we have two major highways through this, through this little bitty town that we're in. And you can, do, you can divide it up. Now, imagine interstates, so, you know. The, the difference that would make. Oh, yeah. We have a, a city councilman here who, who's a friend of ours. He's not, not actually our rep, but we, 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 we hang out with him and talk to him from time to time. And, and he was actually making very similar commentary on that. Um, he was he was driving around with another city councilman, and they, they were talking about all the problems and you know in, in these various areas. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, I understand that. He said, let's go over here now. I, I want to go over here and talk to you. And he said, what about this problem? What about that drainage over there? And, and they were going to uh, the, the lower income parts of town and the, uh, the you know, these, these um, ethnic minority neighborhoods. And he said, he said yeah, that, that, that's an issue too. And, and he said, um, they were talking about how they don't hear from these communities as much. And he said, well, you know. Uh, and and he knew a lot of these people. Th- th- this guy is very concerned with, and, and I don't agree with all of his methods, but I, I think his heart's in the right place. He's he's very concerned with helping minorities. Yeah, uh, yeah. And um, he he said he said, well well that's a uh, you know I, I'm gonna make up names here, but but we don't hear from these people. He goes, I hear from Juan all the time. He said he he's in my place all the time telling me about this. And 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 Jose over here, I mean he's he's having trouble with his business and all this. And, and and he he goes in these communities and and talks to people and and he kind of knows what's going on in those areas. But there's a there was an apparent disconnect mm-hmm. between the governance of the city and what was going on in in these particular particular ethnic neighborhoods, um, and and that wasn't being accounted for in, in the planning of these things. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and I think that's that's pretty common. Yeah. The 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 vocal major or, or the vocal minority is going to be overheard. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and I saw that. Over and over again, uh, you know, we talked about the interstates going through cities. There was a there was a, an original plan was to take the interstate through Greenwich Village in New York, but you can imagine what happened. The mm-hmm. uh, the the uh, wealthy whites came out and said, "Not in my backyard." The people yeah. who so were affluent enough yeah. to take the time to make their voice heard. Yeah, if you could take, and that's, that's they have, a they big have enough money they can take off and protest. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and that that's the way. That's the way the system works. Yeah, well, and, and you know, one of I'm going to get on my own little soapbox here. Uh, one of the things I, I've been really pushing in, in city council meetings, one of the reasons I've been going and I've been talking to these people is I think that there was a 
certain amount of necessity by the way people communicated at the time to that, right? Mm -hmm. I wish it wouldn't have been the case, but I think the fact that we communicated by post and, and these other methods, you didn't really have a choice. But I think part of the problem, and this is a widespread problem with government in general, they're slow to act, but it's 2017 and people can tweet yeah, we can from their phone. Yeah. And, and we don't have to be in the same physical place. And people in these neighborhoods, almost all of them have a smartphone. I mean, and, and, and it may be a, a prepaid smartphone, but you can still download the apps. I mean, it, it, there's definitely differences in the types of phone people have, but a lot of them can get to these platforms. And if, if we can integrate these easy to access platforms with the governing bodies that are making these decisions, we can start to get feedback but it, 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 there, there's been a really slow adoption within government bodies of these platforms. Yeah, Post yeah. notices on City Hall door. Yeah, on the. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to go into sorry, Jacksonville. Let's, let's not do. Yeah, that. Sorry. The law. <laughs> the law does require that. Now they, need, they need to go beyond that. that. They need to go beyond that. And though. that's yeah. what we keep hearing is, well, that's what we're required to do by yeah. law. That. The law doesn't yeah. stop yeah. you from doing other the, things. Too. I, I work in a school district, and I still think it's it, it, it's just hilarious that our school board meetings are posted on the front door of our right? school. But the law requires that it be done. Well, and, and, and so do that. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 do but, that. but you've got to go beyond. You've exactly. got to do something else. Yeah, so, so when I go and gripe about these things, I say, hey, why isn't it on the calendar on the website? I mean, you need to let people know about these things or they're never going to interact. And, they, and, and the answer I've gotten over and over, even from people who are sympathetic to what I'm saying, yeah. has been... Well, they're not violating the law. That's all the law requires them to do. Yeah. I am. We're not accusing you of violating the law. I am we're damn tired of being a jackass. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I am damn tired of people in Austin, Texas, trying to tell us what we need to do in Jacksonville, Texas. Yeah, if you have to do that, do it. But that has nothing to do with what else we do. Yeah, you know? I, I agree. I agree. The other problem that that these these interstates have done by cutting off neighborhoods, and it, and it's it is literally cutting them off. Mm -hmm. you're, you're shut off from things. It's created legacy owners. It's created people that have inherited land there that, frankly, that land, it, you can't sell it. Yeah. Nobody wants it, and you're stuck with it. You're They're, they're there paying taxes Yeah, who the on hell wants for, to live on the side of a, an interstate? And yeah, and w which means they're not going in and fixing it. And it's mm -hmm. it's created a, a, you know this, this self-fulfilling prophecy where this, this neighborhood, well, you know, we shut it off because it was a blight. Well, now it's a blight, blight getting worse because you shut it off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's and, rotting. Yeah. And beyond that, we're going to go through and we're going to zone this just for a uh, residential area. Yeah. So you can't bring business in to fix that. You know, that, that, yeah. that, that's always going to be an issue. Uh, the next section I want to go through is talking about a walking city. But before we get that, you want to talk about this beer? Logo? I was Absolutely. just about to ask you about that. Who wants I, to start this one? I can start this one. Uh, this this beer has been a really interesting experience for me. So uh, what was that uh, pecan ale? We actually saw it yesterday at the store. Southern Pecan by... Southern Star Brewing yes, Company. Yes, Southern Star, I think. yes. So I'm kind of comparing this and contrasting this to other pecan ales that uh, we've drank in the past. I don't know that the flavor is as good as those. If I'm just going to say, like, what did my taste buds react the best to? I don't think this is as good. However, so Lazy Magnolia. Lazy Magnolia. Brewing company. Yes. No, the, the beer is still Southern, Southern Pecan. Southern Pecan. Yes. Su Lazy Magnolia. So I don't think that it. my taste buds reacted as positively to this beer. However, a lot of those pecan beers um, attain that positive taste in what I consider a very cheap way. They sugar it up, mm -hmm. uh, either through underbrewing or through back sweetening. This tastes, and this is going to sound kind of gross at first but i'm gonna come through <laughs> with, some, with some positives like pecan wood it tastes very woody um there is a little bit of sweet but you really taste pecan if you're looking for that oaky pecan wood flavor and 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 you know kind of the same wood notes that you'd get in kind of a wit an aged whiskey or something I, like that i would i would call it a roasted flavor mm -hmm. yeah roasted yes yeah. Um, this, this is a great beer for that. And I love that they stepped outside of that very sweet kind of pecan flavor. And they it's not did pecan pie. It's pecan. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yes. And, and I love that they stuck to it. I love that they did that. So that gets a little bit of boost, but I'm kind of torn on, but if I'm going to be honest, pe the pecan pie beers are, they, they taste a little bit better. Um, but I, I'm still going to give this a, a, a good rating, uh, 
I'm going 3-1 on this beer. All right. You or me? I'll let you go. All right. Uh, I wish y'all could have seen the look on my face whenever I was told that we were do, doing a pecan ale because I don't like pecans. It's not my fla- flavor. Uh, I, they're, they're, I'll eat almost anything, but pecans are not something that I, I really like for the most part. Um, I don't like the aftertaste of a pecan. It just, it, it, I don't le- like the texture. It, it leaves something, it's something in there that, I, that I'm not crazy about. But I am pleasantly surprised with this beer. It's got a smoothness to it. Mm-hmm. The pecan flavor is wonderful. Yeah, it is. It doesn't have that that uh, uh, bite on the after on the backside yep. that so much pecan has. It's just uh, it, it's smooth. There's a cream to it that I like. Yes, mm-hmm. it's not heavy, but there's a cream. Um, I, I liked your description of, of it being woody or, or roasted. I think that's an, that's an accurate uh, idea, and I'm glad it doesn't have all the sugar of like a pecan pie. Yeah, yeah. I don't like a sweet beer, so mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, to me, this beer does absolutely everything right. Uh, I I really like it. I am I am pleasantly surprised that I like this. I think this beer would be wonderful around a campfire at night. It's oh, got yeah. that, it's got that perfect uh, flavor to it that would that would be good. Just a little uh, bit of chill makes you kind of come in close to the campfire. And, and, <laughs> and I will tell you that that as it sat here and, and it's gotten warmer, this beer's gotten better as it's gotten yeah. warmer. Yeah, those pecan flavors yeah, really come out. They're coming out, and, 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 and I like this as a warm beer, which is what you want around a campfire. You don't want something that you want that you have to serve very, very cold around a campfire. you're by fire. Yeah, yeah, you're by fire. I'm going to give it uh, – I'm, I'm going – I can't believe I'm going this high with this beer because it's – it's. I really, really like it. Um, I'm going to go 3-5. Wow. I really like this beer. Okay. Well, so after John – Gave his rating, and before Mike did his, I went ahead and I called mine at a 3.3. Um, I I don't eat pecans. Pecans are disgusting. Fuck pecans. But I like pecan flavoring. Um, and I don't mean like the artificial flavor. Like, I like the taste of a pecan pie, but I don't like the pecans in it. Again, it, it's just a texture th- thing. But this... And I actually didn't look to see... They say it's made with local pecans, so I would assume they're saying that. I would assume that means they legitimately put real pecans in here. Um, Tastes like it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they do. That it's not some artificial fake pecan flavor. And it, even if it is artificial and fake, it tastes real. And I I do really like that. Um, I was a little bit concerned because it's not just a pecan ale. It's pecan ale with honey. And you can taste that kind of um, yellow amber flavor to but it. But it's an accent. It's yeah, not it, it's not strong in there at all. And so whenever I saw that this was pecan ale with honey, I was concerned that it was going to be too sweet. But they have... But it's not a sweet beer at all. They have managed to really bring out the pecan flavor. It's still nice and beery. This is, it's not a beer that is so flavored that you taste more like you're drinking a mixed drink than a beer. I think the honey comes really out of the cream. That. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's where you're tasting it, isn't that creaminess? Yeah. And and that creaminess, I think, um, really kind of ties everything together. It's not a sweet cream, but it's just something to make it a little bit more smooth. Um, so with that, I do give this a 3.3. Um, I'm really enjoying this beer, and I'm glad that we stopped when we did to um, to rate it because I'm nearly out. Yeah, me, me too, me too. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I didn't read this before, and I don't think it should necessarily affle- reflect on the rating itself, mm-hmm. but I love that it's local pecans, local honey, and locally brewed. Back to what we were talking about, transportation, keeping the money in the community. Yeah, keep it in the community. That's, that's and awesome. And so anyone in Seguin, Texas, uh, or anyone in it's the area. It's a great little community, by the way. If you've never been, Seguin is an awesome community. Yeah. Go down, check it out, spend your money locally. Don't give it to, to InBev. Don't yeah. do that. Go down to BS Brewing in Seguin, Texas, yeah. and get a yeah. beer from I them. really want to okay. go, like, go down there and ask them if that is intended to be bullshit. Brewing. I don't know, but I'll be down there. I'll, I'll be like 30 minutes from there for Thanksgiving, so I may have to make a visit. Nice. Uh, so the important questions now, uh, we, we've got to go around. We've got to go around. Date beer, John. Date beer. Okay, so this is definitely not a first date beer, and this is not like a breakup beer. So here's what I'm going to say. Um, usually, either right before or right after you, you start to move into to, to engagement or marriage area, 
a lot of times couples like to get away from everything and go out into the woods. So I'm going to stick with what you said. Take her on a picnic. Take her out uh, on a camping trip if that's your thing. And if it's not your thing, uh, take her out to like a, a Burning Man or something. Take her out into nature. Be a great Burning Man beer. Yeah. And have a beer. Yeah. Does, uh, does it go alongside yeah. the shrooms? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, shrooms and pecan beer. All right. So for me, uh, not a lawnmower beer at all. This is no. this is too heavy for a lawnmower. Uh, it, it, this is a, this is a this is a winter fall beer. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And now for the most important question that uh, that that we've thrown out there. Would this beer get you laid, Anna? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 100%. This beer would do it. So if you're going into the woods, bring like a, a nice mat or a mattress or, or a bed of the a tarp. tarp. <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes. You don't want pine needles in your asshole. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. They're, they're pointy. But no, for real, um, I think this is a beer that you can give to somebody who likes beer. Uh, and I, I think there's it's a beer drinker's beer. I think there's a small subset of people who, who maybe say, I don't like beer, that would enjoy this. Um, Texans particularly, people who like pecans especially. Who grew up in that southern pecans. culture. Yeah, no. They're pecans. No. <laughs> I will stab you. Uh, they are not pecans. You know, it's, it's funny. You talk about the southern culture with pecans. Um, most places where I grew up, and even in this very house that, that we're recording from, there's pecan trees all over yep. here. That's all we have, literally. Yeah, d- during well, that and pine. But, no, uh, I'm talking I mean, in our here, yard. Here, yeah, but I mean in the area. Um, but during the um, the the fall, it, it, it's a common pastime, especially for young children, to, to walk through the yards, pick them up, and just snack on a pecan yeah. as yeah. you're walking to school. Old people will hire young people to go pick their pecans and bring it to them. We start making... Because it uh, sucks whenever you're like walking through your yard barefoot we start or making, mowing and you create little yes. little, little landmines yeah. yes we, we we start making candy pecans and pecan pies just from our own yards i mean that's yeah. just that's just a southern tradition yeah uh from this area and and so we we all have memories and 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 childhood events that are tied to this yeah. this kind of flavor I, I lived a block away from here when i was in high school and yeah. i can remember filling up trash bags yes. with pecans out of the front yard like yeah, a huge garage trash can yeah, trash yeah, bags yeah. yeah but no um if she likes beer this will get you laid if she is from the south and likes pecans this will get you laid it's yeah. a good beer yeah. if, if if you give her this beer and doesn't get you laid it wouldn't it's not gonna work out just yeah move on. Just see move. i was thinking so you're talking about like what date this would be a good beer for and i was over here like uh, the people on youtube are gonna see i'm over here like making numbers i'm like date two maybe three i came through date four like my thought is if she's got the the three date rule that I think most people listening are probably familiar with, if she's got the three date rule, you also need to have a three date rule. Give her this on the third date. If she doesn't like it, don't don't go out with her again. It's not worth it. If she doesn't like this, she's I, not gonna like you. I think it'd make a good weed out there too, though. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I do. Just on that first date, go here, try this. Yeah. You you like that? No? Okay. Pack your bags. Yeah, right. <laughs> you should have here. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. Fuck off. All right, so I'll, getting back to the, the subject, um, there, there's been a big movement to try and, and kind of change our cities from being uh, car-centered to being mm-hmm. people-centered. Yeah. And that means developing walking cities again. And if you've ever been to a walking city, they're amazing. Oh, yeah. We have not built, we have not built a great city in a century. Yeah. We really haven't. Uh, and, and the reason why is because of cars. Yeah. We, uh, and when I, when I say we, I don't just mean the United States. I mean, globally, we have not built a great city yeah. in, 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 in the last century. Um, what, what are the, when I say walking city, what, what comes to your mind? I'm just kind of, kind of want to, want to go around and think about it. I'm, I'm thinking of right now, and I don't remember the town, maybe, maybe, um, uh, Anna Karamami, but in Ohio, we have the national convention. What, Columbus. Columbus, Ohio. And I remember when, whenever we were there, we parked our car for the hotel, and we never touched it again. We never left the hotel. Yeah, we did. That's not true. We went like to two restaurants down the street. Yeah, we, we did. But but part of the reason we got that feeling that we never left the hotel is not only on the street level, but on the building level, the buildings had walkways between them. Yeah, you could, without did. going on an elevator, you could go around town and, and check it out, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And, and they had walking cool. sidewalks and everything, but you could you could traverse a, a lot of at least that area of the city, and never see a car and never hit a road because you were traveling between buildings. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, what I remember is when we were in San Vito and there was like, San Vito? Oh, oh, sorry. I was I was thinking of uh, uh, Ramos. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, no, not Ramos. Uh, no. Yeah. Um, when we were in San Vito, there was like the inner city had a whole. It had a wall around it. Everything outside was car centric, um, but within this wall, it was like weird to drive. The roads were in many places too narrow to have two cars go down them. Of course, all the cars were also smaller, but still. Um, and there were only like three roads in the inner yeah, area. Yeah, everything else was intended for pedestrians. Yeah. And but I think that's the so key. Nice. That's the key to a walking city. They also took just one more piece of this. At the edges where those roads came in, there were parking areas. You paid, you parked your car, and what everybody did, unless they had a very specific, like, I'm delivering to this store over yeah. here. They parked their car, they, they, they got their little ticket for, for their parking permit, and then they walked. And when they were done in town, yeah, they walked back the to your car, you paid your little $3 or whatever, you got in your car, and then you drove yeah, off. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I've been around the world in the Marine Corps, and, and I've seen some great walking cities. Uh, Barcelona was a great walking city to be in, where, where you know from the ship we could go out and we could walk and hit all the restaurants and the bars in the area. Gibraltar, greatest walking mm -hmm. city in the world to me. Venice uh, was a good walking uh, city, but it fucking smelled. I love Venice. Uh, <laughs> I, I was I was there in the winter time. Yeah, so we it were made there in summer. Uh, and Venice, great walking city. Anywhere in Greece was a good walking city when I was there. Um, small small alleyway, small walking yeah. way. The key to a good walking city is narrow roads. Yes. It discourages yeah, driving. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing, um, it, whenever you talk about a walking city, I don't know if this develops through planning or naturally, but it's not just about having the walkways and removing the roads. The city in itself kind of encourages you to move, to yeah. keep going. Yeah, well, there's, there's characteristics you can do. Um, and and, and think, about, think about these things because whenever we're building cities, if you're trying to correct a city, it's very hard to do. Yeah. yeah. But if you're building a city, there, there, there's some characteristics that city planners look for. First off, you, you build to the road. Your great walking cities are the, the buildings come right up to the yeah. road with a small walkway. Mm -hmm. uh, and parking is – if there's parking at all, there may be a little curbside parking because that provides a wall of steel to protect your, 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 your passenger or, or your, your pedestrians. Mm -hmm. But your parking is in the back in, in, in garages or so forth for the most part. You want your you want your uh, your your buildings to come right up to the front, so people feel welcome to go in. Think about how unwelcoming uh, Walmart with a giant parking lot in front of it really is. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's walking up to Walmart. Uh, no, for the most part, it's it's no. just, it, it's yeah. not it's not effective. It's you know, it, it, it's funny. Uh, a friend of mine wrote, wrote this wrote this little comedy bit about it. He was he was doing comedy at the time, but uh, uh, it, it it was so true. He sat there and said that that. Uh, Walmart is like the the most con the Walmart parking lot is like the most controversial place because everybody comes in there and they're driving around they're like honking at the at the pedestrians like move what are you doing get out of the way and and honking and trying to run everybody over they park their car they get out they lock it and they're walking and somebody's behind them say like, hey I'm walking here yeah. move it yeah. <laughs> everybody thinks they're the boss in the Walmart yeah, parking yeah. lot everybody True. thinks that everywhere yeah. don't pretend yep. Yeah. A lot of truth to that, but your 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 walking city also has. What are you doing besides driving? There's motorized? a wasp flying around the room. The uh, um, the other thing that the walking city does is it has narrow roads with with low speed limits. Now, yeah. I, John, we talked about this before the show, and and, and, I, and, I, and I told you at the time. Let's save it for the show. Yeah. One of the things that that your um, city planners are encouraging cities to do is to make the roads narrower. Mm -hmm. And John said, "Well, why would that help?" Well, we know statistically that narrow narrower roads are safer roads mm -hmm. because people drive slower on them. Yeah. Uh, but that it also in, creates a, a sense of place. How do you do this? Think about the size of – well, right here in this town, we have these wide, wide roads around yeah. here. Uh, think about how much more you could do with these roads if you narrowed the roads, put a wider wider sidewalk, and mm -hmm. allowed parking along the side of the roads. Yeah. You'd have a, a, a place where people – you know, the, the cars along the side of the road would provide that wall of steel to protect your pedestrians. Your pedestrians would have these open areas there to, 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 to gather. 
Uh, you could put green areas with 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 seating in places. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something that works in cities. Well, and, and it actually creates a safer environment to have narrower roads. Yeah. These wider roads are they're treated like speedways. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the problem with wider roads in your in your uh, your, your community. I want to throw As you mentioned that people d- that drive down the street next to our house because they drive so fucking fast. But you want to throw things at a lot of that's people. That's also true. Um, as you mentioned that, you know, it, it, it's funny because when, when I think back to when I was riding my bike regularly, um, it was the wider roads that really intimidated me mm-hmm. getting across five lanes of traffic and maybe just this yeah. very narrow shoulder and all that. Um, and you know, kind of beyond that, whenever you get to one of these cities with, with very, I'll call it inadequate roads for, for the city, what you find is people say, should I walk or should I drive? Because it's just as quick to walk because of all the stopping and going. And people start to take this mentality with those cities of driving is for transporting large amounts of things, not for transporting you and your kid three blocks down the road. Yeah, when you absolutely. have these very, you know, open, very inviting roads, you say it's three blocks down the road. Well, I can walk three blocks or I can spend, you know, five cents worth of gas be there in a, a third of the time and you know so so it, everybody drives for well i can't tell you the number of times i've literally driven two blocks to go to the little dollar store when i needed something or other right um because there aren't good sidewalks so you have to walk in the street and it's not fucking safe to walk in the street because people don't pay attention to what they're doing. They're driving too fast. And even on a two-block walk, it's like twice as quick in your travel time because the roads are so... Yeah. Here's here's the other thing that, that we've learned. Uh, and and th- this this surprised me and shouldn't have because when I thought about mm-hmm. it, it didn't. And that's that these, these cities are going through and they're saying, well, we've got to widen this road because traffic is going to increase. Yeah. So they widen the road and then traffic increases. Yeah. But they're, they're saying that statistically it's not that... Uh, uh, that, that the road needed widening. This, you know, a two-lane road can take up to ten thousand cars an hour. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's the standard. So they do these studies, and these these roads have four, or five thousand cars an hour there. But they're saying, but it's going to get bigger. Right. So they widen it, and now all of a sudden it does get bigger because you've created that system. Well, and that's what I've seen a lot of is that no matter what size the road is, the it's traffic full. is going to yeah, it's going to be. Full, it is, period. and 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 this is why a lot of cities are today going through. Uh, Seattle's done a great job. Mm-hmm. Seattle actually went through and removed a highway out of the city. They took a highway out of the city and turned it into a park and moved it so the so the highway goes around the city. Nice. Oh. And 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 their reasoning behind that was, you know, we we, we want we, we want a sense of place. Mm-hmm. Now, if you know your geography, place. Uh, if you've got to talk about place, it doesn't mean the same thing as location. When you talk about place, you're talking about where we you're there and you you know what it's like. You know the characteristics mm-hmm. of the people. It's something unique, and they're trying to create a community that feels different than anywhere else. Right. So what did they do? They pulled this highway out. And it was, uh, I think it was eight miles. And now they have this long park through here. It's got a bicycle lane where they go through. They made the whole community uh, bicycle friendly. They went through and they, they took all these four lane roads. They dropped them to two lane roads in these areas and put parking along the side. Mm-hmm. They took trees and planted them. Uh, and the trees aren't there to be beautiful so much as they're there to provide walls and give people a sense of place somewhere. And mm-hmm. shade. Uh, shade and, and, and a protection for the pedestrians from, from these hurtling pieces of steel coming down the road. You know, small clearance. Uh, uh, it, small clearance. And it's worked. Seattle is one of – they started this in the 1970s. It is one of the most successful cities uh, in, in the United States. It's the second fastest growing city in the United States right behind Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Okay? So you start seeing this. And they went through and asked people questions. Why? Why are, are, are you moving here? And over and over again, they found that these it, the, the millennials, that they have been there and visited, mm-hmm. and they have decided, I'm moving to Seattle and then they start looking for a job. Yeah. The jobs aren't what brings them there. It's the sense of place that brings them there in the first place. And that brings the jobs in. And that yeah. brings the jobs in. And we have been thinking about that backwards for 100 years. Yeah, yeah we have. We have. It's funny you Shocker. mentioned that because four, uh, four blocks east of here, there's a nice park. 
There's a, there's a pool yeah, over yeah. there, and, and, and there's play stuff, and the dogs can walk. I mean, it's a great park. There's a little almost nothing bl- park uh, to the, the two southwest, blocks. Yeah. two yeah. blocks away. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I've been sitting at the house board. Maybe the wife's out of the house. Maybe maybe she was here, but she was busy. And I said, you know what? It'd be nice to go down to the park and just walk around the park and everything. And I think about the track. Because as she said, the sidewalks aren't great. Um, and the, the, way this, exist? the way this town did sidewalks is there was a time when people could opt into sidewalks and yeah. pay the city. And some houses did and some houses didn't. So you'll have sidewalk going down. Then there'll be a house and the sidewalk skips. And then it'll be sidewalk for maybe another house. And then sidewalk skips again. It's just the weirdest thing. Yeah, if you want to stay on sidewalk, you like go for two houses, cross the street. Go for a house, cross the street, go for three, yeah, cross it, the street. It's, it's odd. I, I, I can, uh, you know, again, growing up in this neighborhood that you're in now, uh, I can remember as a kid, it, it's a lot different now because we would sit out there on the front porch and everybody would get out in the streets and they would walk and they would just walk in the streets. And, you can't and, do that and It was anymore. a massive, I mean, I mean, it, it was a big neighborhood and you knew all of your neighbors mm-hmm. and it's just not true anymore. You just yeah. don't do it. So I think about the trek down there and I'm like, you know what? I don't like that. So I end up coming back in and maybe playing a video game or watching YouTube or doing anything like that. One of the reasons I got this house, it's got four exit doors and there's doors everywhere. It's a wide open uh, 1950s style home. Um, and you can open all the windows and the breeze comes through. We don't do that because we have central. But the, the house kind of encourages you to go outside. But what I found, and I love that we go on the porch all the time and either smoke a cigarette or just sit around and talk. We have huge porches. What I found is the house encourages me to go outside. I get up there and I say, I can't go. Well, now I'm that. trapped. I'm trapped in the yard now. Yeah. And it doesn't encourage me to get out in the neighborhood because the neighborhood is not encouraging. Well, and what's interesting there is I, I do think that that, that discouraging of traveling to the park or, or traveling to a shopping center or something like that. Maybe not the shoppers shopping center so much, but pushing you back into your house. Um, I I think does drive a lot of consumerism because then you want to have all the things in your house to keep yourself occupied. You want to buy new video games or new movies or, you know, subscribe to a new streaming service. And, 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 Right there, you've got to the problem of the suburbs. Yeah. The problem of the suburbs is that, uh, you know, you can live out there in your little piece of... Mm -hmm. The suburbs were originally supposed to be your piece of the country. Yeah. You know, but instead it's become little bitty cookie cutter houses that all look the damn same, lined up next to each other, and it's become suburb hell. Yeah. I, uh, before the show, I was, I was telling, uh, telling... I just typed in suburbs are because I was yeah. curious into Google uh, to see what would what would come up there. Let me pull this up here. I made a screenshot of it. This is, this is not me. This is not my bias, okay? All I typed in was suburbs are in Google, and the autofill out fill gave me suburbs are boring, suburbs are bad, suburbs are dying, suburbs are a trap, and suburbs are depressing. <laughs> that tells me something about what people think about the suburbs. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the reason why is because they do not have a sense of place or a yeah. sense of community. I mean, I, I can remember, I lived in a suburb years ago. Most of us did growing up at some point in, in our life. I lived in a suburb, and when I was in the Marine Corps sitting there and realized that I was in this great suburb, beautiful houses and all this, and I, in the couple of years I lived there, I'd been in the kitchen of my neighbor's of one of my neighbor's houses one time in my life. Yeah, yeah. That's, there's, that's not a neighborhood. No. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. I know two of our neighbors, and the only reason one of them was really inviting, and 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 actually, um, uh, sorry, I know three. One of them I only see while they're passing by, um, but one of them was really inviting. Actually, when we first bought the house, we weren't living here all the time we were we were kind of traveling back and forth moving stuff and he just came over and mowed our lawn with that with that word he yeah. was he, he was really inviting so that was so, kind of a weird thing it, it was we showed up and our lawn was mowed and we we're like who mowed our lawn but it was really inviting and and he kind of initiated that contact so mm-hmm. so that was him beyond that i have literally like had to take active steps to to, to meet my neighbors i mm-hmm. saw one sitting out smoking i just i walked across the street and said hey i'm your neighbor and like took that active step and the other one is our neighbor that didn't have a street between us 
And we, we sit out, because like I said, our house drives us outside, but once we get out there, we're trapped. We've sat out in our garage so many times, just seen him walking by, and we, we say, say hi whenever he goes by. I, I, I've never really stopped and had a conversation with the guy, but we have people living right next to us that we don't know. I've never been in any of, of, of my neighbor's houses, and, and I've, I've invited them um, to, to, to things, and, but the whole thing feels, we're so close, yet so disconnected here. Yeah, 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 it, it, it's just, it's, it's not a community. It's, yeah. it's really not anymore, and that's what you're trying to fix with this stuff, and there are towns that are, that, that are, that are doing a good job. How do you go about fixing this? Well, I think the best way to, to, to create a, a, a walking neighborhood that's sustainable is to go through and, and, and look at zoning laws and make mixed-use zoning. Mm-hmm. And this is happening now. We have situations where instead of building out with urban sprawl because urban sprawl is bad, it's ugly, it's unattractive, we don't, we don't feel good about it. Mm-hmm. We're going to build up. We're going to build up, build up, and we're going to make the bottom floor – Shopping. We're going to make it right. retail. We're going to make it business. Maybe the second floor is is industry, but then above that is going to be residential areas. Mm-hmm. And you do that because you, you create a sense of community right. where you're loyal to the businesses in your area. You can go down, and and communities are now pushing this in a big way. There's a there's a little uh, bedroom community of Philadelphia. I can't think of the name of it right now, but they they've created this situation where every neighborhood, every block is set up this way with uh, with mixed use zoning and they push this through and their slogan is leave your keys at home because once you're there you've got a you know you've got a garage oh, your park, car keys leave your car keys at home okay don't you don't have to worry about your car keys anymore you're there you can work here you can uh you can buy your goods here mm-hmm. you can live here everything is right here and you know your neighbors and they've large vast plazas out here where you can where you can come in and and i, I think that's the way to go uh, last summer, I was in Las Colinas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was killing some time. I had to pick my sister up at the airport at DFW, and, mm-hmm. and her, her plane got uh, – got, got, she missed her, her connecting flight, so I had to spend the night there. And I went into Las Colinas. You ever been to Las Colinas? I think I've driven got the through Mustangs, there. The, the, the Mustang statues? Yes. I took yeah. – That was the most uh, – I fell in love with that community. Because it, it, that's how it's set up. It's, it's, they've got these townhouses. They're on the second floor. Everything below it is retail. And it's, it feels like home when you're there. Yeah. And that's the new model that, 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 that cities are going to. And I think that's a sustainable form of, of, uh, of building because you're not polluting the land. Mm-hmm. The fact is we can't continue to be an automobile culture. We, we can't. can't do it. We we, we don't have we don't have the the uh, natural I don't resources. I want for to. It. I spend like four hours a day driving, and it sucks. Well, it's a great time to listen to this podcast. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So so what you do is you, you you know you go through this. The second key point is, and and this is one that's that, that's very controversial. And that's that if you're going to put affordable housing in. If you're going to put government housing in, it needs to look like regular housing. Yeah. yeah. And and that's not that's something that we don't do well. Yeah, I I mean, you can drive into any town and you can you can identify the projects. It, it's it's built cheaply. They all look the same. And they look dis, they look the same as each other and distinctly different from everything else around them. Now, we hear this over and over again and and, and I saw it in, in the discussions. That, but our cities are already here. We can't. We can't fix this. Right. Barcelona okay. did. Barcelona in Spain did this, and and they went through and looked at it, and they said, uh, you know, the, the 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 height for comfort is six to one. Okay, what we're com- comfortable at in a place, and, and and it's something hardwired into us is we don't like to be in an area where the walls are more than six times bigger than we are. Uh, that, that's just kind of comfort. We we, we want walls now. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those are trees with a with, with a uh, you know a canopy. Sometimes they're buildings. But we like the idea of a plaza that that, that, that shut in. Think of uh, Vatican Center, the mm-hmm. center of Vatican City. Uh, you know, you've got those walls around you. None of those buildings are more than five stories high. That's roughly six to one. Right. You know, four to five stories. So you start looking at this stuff and and. and and they went through and they said, uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put a plaza. And then we're going to go through here and we're going to break Barcelona up into super blocks. Now, they didn't do it everywhere. Right now, they're experimenting. They've done it in 30 areas around Barcelona. And a super block is 16 blocks. We talked before. That's usually yeah, considered to be a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. 
And what they've done is they've allowed the major roads to come on the outside. So you can go 55 miles an hour or whatever on these outsides of these. But inside, they've shrunk the roads down to two-lane roads, and it's 10-mile-an-hour speed limit. Oh, my goodness. That is so slow. 10-mile-an-hour speed limit, and they put parking on the side, and they've rezoned to allow things like uh, sidewalk cafes and stuff. And what's happened is each one of these super blocks has become their own community. Mm-hmm. And industries, you know, jobs have come in, and they don't have to have fucking craft fairs to get people to come out to the plaza. Right. Instead, people come out because they want to be there. Yeah. There's yeah. something that makes them want to be there. Can, can, can we talk for just a little bit about various levels, but government spending on this? Okay. Yeah. Be, because I, I think whenever people get this idea in their head of... of well, we need to, to rebuild the city. They say, well, okay, let's have the government come in and just pay to, to level this stuff and rebuild it. And th- they see that as the ultimate solution. And, and I think that, for myself, is a terrible solution to the problem for a number of reasons. One, anytime you talk about leveling a building... You're talking about taking people's existing homes away. I think you're putting the cart before the horse. You're talking about uh, about stealing property. Yes, you're talking you're talking about taking their property away. And then when you talk about centralized planning of that property, you're sitting there and saying that I mean it's a very anti-democratic idea that this one person is so freaking brilliant that they can tell this community of people what needs to be in their community. Yeah, it's grossly way, authoritarian. Way better than that community could ever say for itself. Absolutely. And, 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 and that takes us into that last section I wanted to talk about, which was the ethics of zoning laws. Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think a better solution to this, and one that I think is easily implementable is to go through, obviously the government's going to set the speed limit on the roads, and some very, some very small things in here. They, they have, they're the only ones who can do that. But I think all you need to do is go into one area and provide a better option. And when the better option exists, people will move in. We saw this yeah, in, yeah. in these communities where millennials are moving in. Make a one better option, and then make another better option, and people move in. As, is- as they're moving in, they're moving out of these other areas, and those areas will get redeveloped toward the new model. Yeah, what they need to do, it, the government doesn't need to come in and condemn areas and crash it. Mm-hmm. What they need to do here, and, and, and what I would support, and, and, and but we're back into the ethics yeah, of zoning, yeah, exactly. okay? Yes. Is the idea is, is, is to, to remove zoning restrictions to go through and and allow multi-use zoning yeah. in areas. Now, I understand that, that you know, you know, the last 150 years, we've been creating zoning pods. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you, if you drive through any major city, you go through, through, through Dallas, uh, Houston not so much because it's the largest city in the U.S. without zoning laws. Mm-hmm. But any major city, you'll find there's a medical area that's zoned for medical. Yeah. There's an industrial zone. There's a pod for, uh, for industry. And God help you if you get hurt in the industrial zone and need to get to that medical zone. <laughs> I'm telling you. It, uh, but, but there is. Dallas is a great example of that. Yeah. All yeah. the hospitals are in, are in a 16-block area. You know, you know they're, they're all right there. Yeah. However, if you get hurt there, you're fucking safe. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, thank God they were about five blocks from the uh, from where Kennedy got shot. But, but if you need a job <laughs> there, unless you're a medical professional, you're fucked. Yeah, you yeah. are. You're absolutely screwed. Oh, well, you got next door is the market zone where all the market yeah. halls are, so you yeah. can get a job there. Uh, but the, what, what government can do, and I think, I correct, I, I kind of want to talk about this, mm-hmm. yeah. if whether you think it's right or not, because... You know, the libertarian side of me wonders wonders about this. But part of me says that it would make sense to me for the government to come through and do like Barcelona did with the super blocks and say, you know what? We're going to create this 16-block area. We're going to allow traffic to travel through on these roads. We're going to have these roads that go through. But the rest of these, we're going to drop them down to two-lane roads. We're mm-hmm. going to uh, going to make them narrower. And then we're going to remove the zoning restrictions and say – Let's see what you can do with it. Yeah, and I look at that, and I, I think that's a very libertarian solution. Now, there are those who are who are on the fringes of libertarianism. They're going to say, "Well, that's not libertarian because they're still controlling still roads." Laws. Yeah. yeah, but but I'm sorry, you had a situation before where there was very strict control in an area, and they said, "Look, we're not going to control the zone anymore. We're taking that away." We are going to continue to control the roads. No, no change there. But we're going to c- control the roads in such a way that encourages uh, 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 pedestrian travel. Now, 
earlier they were encouraging automobile travel. Now they're controlling pedestrian travel. They're going to be pissed people about this. And they should be. Because the government's still controlling how that happens. But there were pissed people before. There were pissed people who wanted pedestrian travel. Now there's pissed people who want auto automobile travel. But in the end, you have removed regulation. Overall, you have let people make personal decisions. You have now created a more libertarian society. And... You've encouraged uh, th these these behaviors. Well, l l let me throw let me throw Houston out at Go you a minute it. because we, we've all been through Houston before. Mm -hmm. Houston is it is touted as this great success story. It is again the largest city in the United States without formalized zoning laws. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that there's no laws. There are there are some that you can't pollute yeah. stuff. But if you drive through Houston, it's the wild wild west of of of. of oh yeah, there's. Industry right next there's to strip, a boutique. There's strip bars next yeah. to schools. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, 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 it is the wild, <laughs> wild west. But let's look at what, what's happened here. Uh, housing is cheaper there yes. than, than any other major city. It's growing faster it's than any other major city. It's the largest in Texas, and that's saying a lot. The, the greater Houston metropolitan area is larger than the state of Rhode Island. Okay? It's also a fucking nightmare to drive but, in. But – there's the other side of it. Because there's not restrictions, there are areas where bad decisions have been made, yeah. and, 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 and it is, it, it's a fucking nightmare in some places. And, and what happens in those areas? Uh, they die. They, they, People move out. They move out. They move to, to like the good the areas. Plague. Those areas get, get – Well, here's the other side. We got hit with a hurricane here, here, here pretty recently, oh. and mm – -hmm. And it got it got hammered pretty bad because of some of these 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 laws that, yeah. that are out there. Okay, now, I, I want some explanation on this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. because you're saying it got hammered pretty bad because of this. So, and my understanding is that the government was always working controlling the drainage in the area. That was never not controlled. Yeah, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had had, had actually gone through and. Well, if you look at the facts, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had come through and said when they built the, uh, the, the, the San Houston Toll Road that they had to build it with drainage underneath it. Yeah. The city of Houston came through and said, no, we're not doing that. Okay. And they did not build that. So they refused to build it. Plus, I think they recently passed a bond to improve drainage that they never acted upon. Is they that did. correct? They did. They did. Yeah. So it's not something that the government was already controlling drainage badly. They did it badly. Yeah, yeah. This has nothing to do with the freedom issue because it wasn't something free. They were just doing it bad. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just you want know. to throw it out there. That that's, I, I want to show that we're, we're, we're seeing both sides. Yes. Right. The, the Army Corps of Engineers said when you build this, you have to build this this drainage underneath it, or you're going to trap all the water inside. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, screw that. We we can do it without it, and they built it without it, and they trapped all the water inside. Right. And, and the only argument we should be having over Houston's zoning laws as it pertains to the hurricane is whether or not there is a moral difference in a strip club flooding next to a school, or whether you should have all the schools in the same area flooding, and all the strip clubs in another area. Well, I agree. Seriously, Pods is seriously a though, yeah. there there is an argument when it comes to safety. I think. Um, of when all of your residents are in the same, you know, all of the residential areas are together, it's a lot easier to evacuate people. You know that, you know, you've got concentrated areas where you need to go and, and check for people who have been I don't know hurt. that that's the case. And I'm not saying that it's, I'm not saying that it warrants zoning. I think it's morally wrong. But, yeah. But, but, but I do think it's easier. Yeah. But, you know, the other side of it was it was a whole lot easier to identify, you know, to catch the, uh, the, the the Japanese saboteurs when they were all in concentration camps, too. Yeah. But it wasn't morally right. Right. Well, well okay. But, but you, you talk about that. Now, first of all, any city the size of Houston, I, I, I'm I, kind of, I'm kind I think of, is the fourth largest city in the country right now. Yeah. So, so let's look at another one that people are familiar. Let's look at Chicago, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you had to evacuate Chicago, Chicago has very strict zoning laws. Very strict, yes. yeah. If you had to evacuate Chicago, do you really think it's just going to be this much better situation than evacuating no. Houston? It's a fucking terrible situation anyway. Oh, yeah. It's a shit situation, no doubt. And and honestly, I think, I think, and, and I don't have the numbers to back this, so maybe some civil engineer can come through and tell me something or shut the fuck up because they're civil. But anyway, 
Sorry, electrical engineer. I got I got a little grudge there, but um, <laughs> but but um, a civil engineer can come through and tell me I'm wrong. But if the people are more evenly dispersed across the city than rather concentrated on a very small number of roads, I would think that would make an easier situation for evacuation. I don't know. I think well, I think that they just drown on a wider scale because the fact is, I don't care how how good your zoning is. Houston's built below sea level. Fuck you. Well, yeah, there yeah. I mean, you're true. Well, and, and <laughs> I mean, if you were paying it's like New Orleans, I it's below sea level. The whole evacuation thing and the point that i was actually trying to make was about rescue efforts oh so okay. yeah. kind of throw this out there just just real i think we know but let's let's go ahead and make it clear uh are, are, what do you think about zoning laws are, do you support do you support cities passing zoning laws or do you support <laughs> the wild west theory of build what you want to where you want to i am one of these weird people that go to to zoning board meetings and sit in and listen to what's going on and sometimes talk about it and i'll tell you the same thing i tell those people who are actually making the recommendations to city council there is nobody on that board who gives an iota more of a shit about the area they're talking about zoning one way or the other for or against the business owner than the people who live there and the very audacity of them to sit up on the board and look a person in the eye who is trying to make their community better in some way and say, no, that's not a good enough way to make your community better. What did better. we do last time? <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not, a better, that's not a good way to make your community better. I care more about your house, your business, your whatever than you do, and I'm going to tell you how you should run it. So it's no fucking, zoning laws? Yeah. It's fucking arrogant and, and, and no ridiculous. Zoning no yeah. zoning laws. Sorry, I had to get on a soapbox. I, I, I I, just... I, I, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm in a rough, rough place here because while philosophically I'm with you, no zoning laws, the other side of me says, I really don't want strip bars next to my elementary school. Uh, well, then what are I you going to do after I don't, school? I don't think they'd be built there, though. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they'd be built there because I think it's a, it's a bad decision. They're, go they're well, going I mean, to build their schools where they think they're going to get the most people because that's yeah. where they get their funding. They're going to build their strip yeah. clubs. where. But I will say that I can remember uh, living in the outskirts. I lived in the suburbs of Houston in, in suburbia hell and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, before I moved to Jacksonville. And as I was driving in, I can remember seeing – strip bars in the weirdest fucking places yeah. you know just just church strip bar right there and and you know that's that's odd well and there's a middle ground here the tabc does this they don't they don't make any rules about where you can build they make rules about where you can't so they say you can't build within so many hundred feet. feet of a school front, front door of a school and, yeah. and they say anywhere else is fine just yeah. you can't build in these areas and i would even be much more okay with that than these very strict you build here, you build here, yeah. you build there. Yeah. For anybody unfamiliar, uh, TABC is what? Texas Alcoholic Beverage Code, Com I think. I think it's commission. Well, yeah. there's Alcohol the code and, and then commission. there's the commission. Yeah, but they, yeah. Th there's a code yeah. written that they, yeah. they, they govern under. Yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. So I think we've uh, – this has been kind of exciting for me. Yes, I, I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I have. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to be in this for months now because yeah. I'm fascinated by it. I like this. It was very much like one of our old school conversations. I kind of want to go back to school now. I kind of want to go back to school with urban planning because this yeah, is right. fascinating to me. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, cool. I want to go fix a city. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, yeah. Do it. So anyway, um, we hope you guys have enjoyed. Um, as always, you can find our show on all of the major and almost all of the minor podcast platforms. If we're not on the one that you want, if us we're to not be on, on it, it doesn't fucking matter. Get a different that's podcast. Also true. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can find us on social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy. Um, we hope you'll reach out to us. Let us know what you think about this episode, or maybe what episodes you want to see us do in the future. Um, other than that, anything else that we need to talk about, guys? All I right. think we're good. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed, and we hope you'll tune in next week. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Like, share, and subscribe. You know, that was the now they see that you're doing that with water glasses. <laughs> oh, we do with all kinds of things. I mean, we've used we've used other glasses. I mean, uh, our our cheers is on the spot every our time. Crystal and is good. <laughs> never planned. It's it's not like we bring things in to cheers with. We yeah, just you're so much. We we just come in and use what we have sitting there. Six pack philosophy can be used to treat closed mindedness, straight ticket voting, and faulty reasoning. Side effects of six pack philosophy may include questioning the status quo, thinking for oneself, and electile dysfunction. Ask your bartender if six pack philosophy is right for you. And as always, keep on drinking and thinking. This has been Six Pack Philosophy.